Sanji, 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 everyone's favorite cook, except for me. Wait, wait, wait. It's more like I kind of have like a love-hate relationship with him. More like a like-hate relationship. But today I'm just gonna focus on my first impression from his introductory arc, Baratie. Manga chapters 42 to 68 and anime episodes 19 to 30. Now making this the longest arc so far. Well, let's just start with a little bit of context. The gang sailed from Zero Village and they actually did something very important. Yes, they created their pirate flag. More like Usopp fix what Luffy was trying to do. Usopp's actually kind of handy, I'll give him that. And I love how Nami was also happily participating in this. Oh my god, I love their ship moments and interactions. Anyway, after this, they suddenly meet these two bounty hunters who knew Zoro from before. Could they be more forgettable? But because one of them almost died from poor nutrition, Usopp mentions that they need a cook, first priority, because Luffy wanted to find a musician next. And then they arrive at Baratie, the floating restaurant managed by ex-pirates. I'm gonna start right away, of course, with Sanji. Sanji is the cook's apprentice in this restaurant, but we see that he doesn't really get along with any of the other cooks or the head chef and owner, Seth, and apparently is constantly causing trouble with customers. Well, after the incident with Gin, Luffy sees how he fed him behind their backs, and it was after this that Luffy asked him to join his crew. Sanji immediately declines and states that he has a good reason to stay in this place. Which makes us wonder, why is he hanging on to this place so badly if everyone wants him gone? After Gin came back with Don Krieg and Sanji once again accepted to feed him, I was really starting to get annoyed with him feeding these assholes. First time Gin didn't have any money, so I wonder why he gave him free food. There must be countless guys like him coming every day demanding food at gunpoint just because they're pirates, so I was happy when they kicked him away. But of course, there was a reason for all this, and it all goes down to when Seth and Sanji met. Sanji was once a cook's apprentice in another ship and had a big dream of his own, to find the All Blue, a legendary ocean where all the seas from north, east, south and west meet and you can find every kind of fish, in other words, a cook's paradise. After Seth's crew started pillaging the ship, a storm hit them and Seth and Sanji ended up alone in a rock with no access to food, with no other option but to wait for a ship to show up. And this, I felt like it was a little too much. Like, we know that Zeph gave Sanji all the food and he cut his own leg to survive. But according to the days shown, Sanji lost his last piece of bread on day 25 and they were found on day 85. I mean, come on, that is 60 days with no food. I'm gonna look that up. Oh, you know what? It turns out it's actually possible. Google Sun says two to three months if they have water. Well, they did have rainwater. Wow, that's a long time. Anyway, we now know why Sanji feels so in debt to Seth. But the thing is, Seth saved Sanji's life because he had the same dream as him, a kid that didn't care about being laughed at, with all his life ahead to achieve what he couldn't. And seeing that all his crewmates were gone, he didn't feel like going into the Grand Line again. So he kind of passed his dream on to Sanji and decided to open a restaurant instead. But Sanji saw this completely different. He felt like he had to devote his life to Seth now and that he took away everything from him. So he had to pay his debt by helping him with his restaurant. We can only assume that Sanji learned a lot from Seth too. From cooking to his fighting style, because Seth also uses his legs to fight. Probably for the same reason, that hands are a cook's life and cannot risk being damaged in battle. Sanji was determined to protect this ship with his life. And it was Luffy's words that started to make an impact on him. He told him that getting killed is no way to repay his debt and that Seth didn't save his life for him to throw it away. Seth told him to pay close attention to Luffy, because people like him that come every once in a while having set his sights on something and that won't quit until they make it or die trying are people he admires, because grit cuts more than steel. We also understand now why he fed these pirates, because they were starving, a feeling he knows too well. 
and also made him understand the value of food and that it shouldn't be wasted. In terms of fighting, he's a kicker and a good fighter. I like the fact that he fights with his feet, but it does make his fighting style look a little funny sometimes. Well, Zoro puts a sword in his mouth, but somehow Sanji still looks funnier. Luffy is also excited that he can handle a fight as well. But I love how Luffy doesn't care about that when asking them to join his crew. He asks them because he values something in them as people. If they can fight or not, it's just a plus. Because I think he believes it's his responsibility to protect his crew as captain. After they saved the restaurant, Sanji finally changed his mind. Kind of. Now he wanted to stay to make Zef acknowledge his cooking skills. Zef, having enough of his crap, told him he could never defeat his skills because he has cooked in all oceans of the world. And then he asked Luffy to take him with him. Because the Grand Lion is his dream, and everyone in the ship already knows that he's a great chef. Sanji, listening to all of this, finally decides to go. The final goodbye is one of the first scenes that got me emotional. There were some sad scenes before, yes, but seeing everyone crying and Sanji thanking Zef for everything was very touching. It got me a little teary, not gonna lie. Sanji was, for me, just fine so far. He's a little cheeky and sassy, but he's like that only with men. And then we got to the scene with Nami, and I was like, oh, okay. He's a women simp and he's an idiot. Like, okay, Nami is a pretty girl. And I was actually happy that no one cared about that so far. Like Luffy, Zoro, or Usopp, she was just another person to them. But seeing Sanji act like that definitely took away some points in my liking of the character. But I love how Nami just goes along with it to get free stuff. And Usopp's like, hey, what about us? Oh, don't fight for me. Who's fighting for you? I just want food. Back to Sanji. I wasn't particularly excited from him joining, but I wasn't against either. It's just nothing of him was especially attractive for me. I like Luffy, Zoro, and Nami that I was drawn to their characters from the start. For Sanji, I need to see more, to see now if he can grow on me or not. So far, the ladies' man wearing a suit and smoking all the time is not doing it for me. Let's move on to the villain from this arc, Don Creek, my least favorite so far. But before that, let's talk a bit about Gin. I did not like him either. They're both such losers for real. All Gin did was tell Luffy and Sanji and everyone how scary the Grand Line was over and over again. Like, we get it dude, you're traumatized. But every time he mentions something about it, Luffy and Zoro get more excited. And then he brought back Don Creek, like, you promise not to hurt these people, right? I mean, the fact that he was following this man in the first place shows how worthless he is. Anyway, he did show some values at the end by not being able to hurt Sanji for being the first person to ever show him kindness. So I guess I shouldn't be so hard on him. After all, we never know his life circumstances. He also had an overall change of mind, saying that fear and hesitation seem foolish now after seeing Luffy. So at least this guy learned something from this whole experience, even though he didn't look like he had much time left. But better late than never. On the other hand, Don Krieg is just the worst type of trash. I mean, there are some villains that you can't help to like, or at least respect them to some degree. Or at least they look cool. This guy has nothing. He's basically a loser with a superiority complex, full of dirty tricks and no honor, who couldn't handle the Grand Line. So I really don't have much more to say about Don Krieg, because he's so uninteresting as a villain. But he was the strongest one Luffy has fought so far. And speaking of Luffy, I love how he was out of the whole conflict until Creek said he was gonna find the One Piece and rule the pirates. And then Luffy was like, hold it right there. What did you just say? I'm gonna be king of the pirates. So you see, now we have a problem. And I love how he annoyed the crap out of him during the whole battle. Needless to say, this wasn't exactly my favorite arc. I was more into what was happening with the other crew members and a fight that was totally unexpected. One of the bounty hunters that Zoro knows mentions that the guy Zoro was looking for frequents this restaurant. Then Gin mentioned that one guy destroyed seven of their ships in the Grand Line. A guy with piercing hawk eyes. The man Zoro would be looking for. I mean, it makes sense. Like, if he wants to be the greatest swordsman, there has to be someone who currently is, right? And that man is Dracul Mihawk, also known as Hawkeye. Zoro, knowing that he is in the Grand Line, gets more excited to go and find him. 
and Sanji calls him and Luffy fools that are just going to get killed as soon as they get there. But Zoro simply shuts him up, saying that the day he decided to become the greatest swordsman, he gave himself up for death. And he has his reasons, so nobody calls him a fool but himself. Sorry Sanji, you just got totally owned. Point for Zoro. Well, Mihawk was not in the Grand Line. He just happens to be coming to the restaurant. I seen right now. He's, he's just outside, sinking Don Creek's ships once again, <laughs> just for fun. He rules already. I mean, the man has class. I absolutely love the design, and he's totally hot. Apparently, in the manga, his eyes are red, but in the anime, they made them yellow. Well, I think he looks awesome with yellow eyes. But both of them suit him. Well, Zoro doesn't waste two seconds and goes, I challenge you to a duel. The fact that he's tossed the fight with taking out the smallest knife he's got gives you an idea of how powerful this guy really is. But the moment they cross blades, Zoro realizes he's just on another level and that he can't believe how unequal they are and how far away he is from his dream. He obviously loses, but not before leaving an impression on him. First, when Hawkeye asked, why don't you retreat if you know you cannot win? He answers that he can't. Because if he retreats, even one step, everything, his vow, his ambitions, his dream, everything he cares about will be lost forever. Saying he prefers death to defeat. With this, Hawkeye asks to know his name and made him respect him enough to take out his black blade. After losing, he faced Mihawk again from the front, saying that wounds on the back are swordsman shame. And Mihawk just goes, magnificent. Hawkeye was so impressed by him that not only let him live, but said that he shall await him at the top however long it takes, and that he should strive to surpass him. And it wasn't only Zoro that made an impression on him. He first praised Luffy for letting Zoro fight his own battle. And when Luffy told him he wanted to become King of the Pirates, he's the first person that I recall that didn't laugh at him or like didn't think it was not possible. He only said that that's even a more perilous path than surpassing him. I love how classy he speaks. And here is my favorite moment from this arc. Zoro's crying vow, asking Luffy if he was worried because if he fails, he will be disappointed, right? And that never again, he will never lose again. Got a problem with that, King of the Pirates? Hawkeye was just delighted with this too, saying that he hopes to encounter them again in the future, stating that they make a good team. And then he just ignores Krieg and leaves. Like, oh, you were here too. Okay, bye. And speaking of people leaving, just before this fight, they learn that Nami stole the ship and treasure and disappear. Just great, awesome. Well, we all saw this coming. I mean, maybe not exactly that, but we knew she was gonna do something like this at some point. Like, she wasn't an official crew member, and she literally said, I rob pirates from the start. But she did send a message to them. I hope we meet again. And Luffy is determined to have her, and only her, as his navigator. Which I'm not exactly sure why, to be honest, but I'm glad he does. I think in this case it's not something specific, but just his instincts talking. So time to follow Nami it is. But she started acting weird after seeing a wanted poster these guys were carrying. She tricked them and threw them to the sea. Classic Nami. But the important thing is everything she said while going away. She said she wasn't with Luffy and Zoro for long, but she sure had fun. And we can see how she's enjoying herself with these guys. But now she was crying, saying that she hopes they let her sail with them again, if they see each other again. And that she cannot wait to be free. I mean, poor Nami. I love her so much. Guess we'll have to find out all the mysteries surrounding Nami in the next arc. That's it for today. Thank you very much for watching. And we will continue next time with Arlong Park my personal favorite from the East Blue Saga. If you like this video, don't forget to give a like, comment, and you know the red button that says subscribe? You should click it, trust me. See you in the next one, bye!